This desire to avoid the war, another war to end all wars, at every and all costs, is going to produce a systematic policy of appeasement. Now, appeasement can be basically summarized as give the bully what he wants and he'll go away. You may remember if you took my ancient and medieval history class last year that I read a poem by Rudyard Kipling about this very thing called the Dane Gelt, <sighs> advocating not paying the Dane Gelt. But that's an attitude that was rejected in the West as being a sucker for the merchants of death or a sucker for the other romantic and national causes that no sane person could possibly believe in. So, appeasement. Give the bully what he wants and he'll go away. We start out in Japan in September of 1931. Japan is going to begin breaking the Versailles peace, breaking up the international order that was produced at Versailles. Now, here's a basic map of East Asia and the Western Pacific. We have the islands of Japan, including South Sakhalin Island and the Kuril Islands. We've got the Japanese Ryukyus and Japanese uh, Formosa, the country we know today as the Independent Republic of Taiwan. We've got Japanese Korea and the Japanese uh, control all of the former German islands of the Pacific north of the equator. We've got the USSR along the northern fringe of the map, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics or Soviet Russia. We've got an enlarged Mongolia, which is also a communist state nominated at this time by Russia. We've got the Xinjiang province, which is now uh, the site of one of the true genocides that is being perpetrated right now in the world against the Uyghur Muslim population by the Chinese Communist Party. Xinjiang, now called Xinjiang, is a part of the People's Republic of China. The Mongolian border is farther north to include both Inner Mongolia into the People's Republic of China, but at this point it's not. Tibet is, as it should be, an independent nation, not a part of China, uh, ruled by a group of Buddhist monks in Lhasa. There is the Himalayan mountains and uh, British India, which includes Burma. Um, we've got Siam, the independent country today known as Thailand. French Indochina includes uh, what we now call Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Uh, British Malaya and North Borneo, uh, including the British Crown Colony of Singapore, which is the major British base, base east of Suez. Um, the Dutch East Indies, which is now largely the nation of Indonesia. The American Philippines, which uh, we took over after the Spanish-American War. And uh, China itself is divided between the KMT, the Kuomintang, ruled by nationalist Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, and the Chinese communists who went on a long mark, march around China to the city of Yan'an, where Mao holds up near Mongolia, where he can get Soviet support on the border, but not threaten Soviet plans for China using the KMT. Now this area here, Manchuria, is where the last imperial dynasty of China came from. The Manchus were a non-Han Chinese people that uh, came on horseback into China to conquer the place, and they did in the early 1600s. So the Manchus were uh, ruled uh, by the last imperial dynasty, and it was part of China. But Manchuria had been uh, dominated at various times by the Russians who ran a railroad through it to Vladivostok, and the Japanese who wanted uh, territory uh, along the Yellow Sea. But Manchuria at this point is a part of China. That's what all the national maps say. So here is the game board. This is the setting. Now, 
The Japanese have an army in Korea, and they have military forces along rail lines, including at the junction town of Mukden. Before I go on, I've got to explain to you something about Japanese society. The Japanese are unusual. Every young man who has any ambition of doing anything follows something that seems similar to the old Roman patron-client relationship. What a junior officer in the Japanese army or navy, or what a young businessman, a young salesman in a Japanese business is going to want to do is become a client of a wealthy, powerful, successful older man. That older man has power and influence and money, and he wants loyalty. The young men who need power, influence, and loyalty have their loyalty to give in return for those things. But the way the Japanese system works, the junior partner can ask the senior partner for an unspecified favor something that no one fully understands. An unspecified favor could be anything. And the older fellow is obligated to service and uh, basically fulfill the younger fellow's request, whatever it may be. A group of young Japanese lieutenants and captains, junior officers in the Imperial Japanese Army, decide that the world requires Japan to be strong. If Japan is not strong, it's going to invite attack. That Japan has been hiding behind trees and allowing Westerners to dictate to it too long, and that strength should not be limited by the mewlings and bleatings of the weak. In other words, these young officers decide it's time. And they arrange for an incident to happen at the rail junction at Mukden, an attack on Japanese army forces by a group of Chinese government troops. This attack is arranged by the junior officers who get a bunch of their prisoners and they get a bunch they, they basically stage it they have a bunch of people in chinese army uniforms who are not chinese army and the attack goes off in front of press and witnesses and the japanese army has got to defend itself doesn't it so <clears throat> immediately upon hearing about this attack a group of army units just happen to be on the border Cross the Korean border into Manchuria according to a prearranged battle plan that manages to conquer Manchuria in just a few months. It's almost as if they were waiting for a signal, which they were. Now, nobody in Tokyo knew about this. This plan was concocted by a group of lieutenants and captains, guys in their late 20s and early 30s who should have been nowhere near powerful enough to affect national policy or war and peace issues. But the moment that the old men in Tokyo began to wake up hearing reports of fighting in Manchuria against Chinese forces by Japanese army forces defending themselves, and the moment they see the way the Japanese army forces are acting, they realize that something is happening. So they contact their clients through unofficial channels before the high command, the general staff of Japan, is able to get control of the situation. At which point, all of the little lower officers, the junior officers, say, Master, you know that favor? This is it. Back us. Please back us. The emperor will thank you. The empire will be greater for it. This is the price of the loyalty we've been showing you. Back this play. So, the old men in Tokyo are trapped. They're trapped by the customs of Japan. 
and its variant of patron-client relationships. As such, the general staff does not order the withdrawal of the army and make it stick. Instead, there's confusion in Tokyo, which allows the junior officers to further invade Manchuria, which finally results in the Japanese high command going all in for victory. The emperor didn't decide this. The prime minister of Japan didn't decide this. The parliament, the diet of Japan didn't decide this. And the general staff in Japan didn't decide this. A group of armies, lieutenants, and captains decided this, and they made it happen. So now Manchuria is cut out of China, and <clears throat> the last emperor of the, of, of the Qing dynasty, of the Manchu dynasty that ruled China, who's been sort of hanging around as a playboy without a country since his country became a republic, is made into the puppet figurehead of Japanese Manchu Kuo. Manchu Kuo is the Japanese name for Manchuria. And Jirong Pu Yi, the last emperor of the Qing dynasty of China, becomes uh, the emperor of Manchu Kuo, which seems to be an independent nation which happens to be occupied by Chinese, Japanese troops and uh, governed from Tokyo. Puyi is treated like a servant by everyone in the Japanese high command because that's what he is. Manchu Kuo is the first part of what the Japanese begin to call their Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere which is their euphemism for the expansion of the Japanese Empire. Now, at the League of Nations, it's 1931, and the League starts, blah, 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 what's going on? The Japanese are trying to take over Manchuria. What should we do? We should, collective security, we should try to stop them. And at, there's a bunch of anti-Japanese speeches, and then the Japanese ambassador to the League of Nations has an opportunity to speak, and he goes up and he says, if this is the way you're going to treat us with such disrespect, you're going to assume that we're the villains in this piece? We leave the League of Nations. Have fun without us. He leaves. His delegation turns on their heels, gets up and walks out, and the Japanese are gone. They just quit the club. To which the rest of the League goes, Huh? What are we going to do? They left. They're not listening to us. No, they're not. They went home. The League does nothing other than chatter, sending diplomatic communiques, criticizing, but in the end, there's no collective security. Nobody comes to the defense of Manchuria. Manchuria is now conquered. Many people believe, with good reason, that the first shots of World War II were fired on September 18, 1931, when Japan conquers Manchuria. The story will continue.